All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Eric here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Today, I have a very special guest here with me on the channel, Mr. Matt Akuhara. He is a gunner and interpreter for the Matsumoto Castle Gun Course over in Japan. And today, we're going to be discussing, you guessed it, samurai gunslingers. <laughs> and this is going to be so much fun. Matt, welcome to the channel, man. Great. Thanks for having me. Dude, uh, it, it is so crazy. I, I've been following your Twitter page for quite some time, and I'm seeing all this crazy stuff y'all are doing, shooting these random-looking, shortened, like, matchlocks, and you guys are, are really taking on a completely different level of gunnery here. Uh, yeah, we, we did. Yeah, well, we're lucky to have access to, because what we've got at Matsumoto Castle is one of the biggest collections of samurai-era firearms in 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 Japan. So as part of having access to them, cleaning them and displaying them, we actually get to shoot the ones that are in firing condition and the ones that aren't in firing condition, we fix them up and we shoot them too. Wow. Talk about a dream job. So these are literal period correct firearms that you guys are, are going through and, and shooting there at the castle and providing instruction on tactics and techniques. And I mean, there's so many things we're going to talk about, but that, yeah. that is so freaking cool. And you're in yeah, that's Japan right. doing this. They are all actually from the feudal era, the samurai era. These aren't recreated recreations. They aren't modern fabrications. These are actually made in the um, in the era. So as part of shooting them, we also researched them. Who made it? Who is it made for? What was the purpose of this gun? We, we look into a lot of details. So as well as it being a, a shooting team, we're also a research group. So for the uninitiated, um, give the viewers here an idea of now feudal Japan. What would that date range be considered? Well, feudal Japan is what, some people were called the, the samurai era, the samurai era. And that came to an end in 1874 with the major restoration. You've probably seen that Tom Cruise film, which is loosely based on the end of the um, the samurai era. So everything before then was really the samurai era, where we had a emperor who was the emperor and the divine god, essentially, of Japan, and the shogun, who was the military ruler of Japan, who, who essentially held um, the power. And the shogun had various domains this is when the japan was at peace after the warring states area he had various domains with a daimyo or lord in charge of that domain and they would be responsible to him and so as a hierarchy in that sense before that there was no unified japan there was still an emperor but because he was above war fighting he was not considered part of the um of the war but the tribes the various clans in in and around japan would fight each other for supremacy to try and unify the country yeah, almost kind of like, uh, you know, they're they're looking at the emperor and saying, I support you the most. Uh, therefore, I want more power under, you know, under your rule or whatever. So it's like, hey, my my guys went over there and kicked some butt for you. So uh, yeah. you owe me one, pal, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, trying to create alliances and vassal states amongst each other to try and create power. But you, you know what politics is like even in the modern era. You, you, alliances, they come and they go. You, when they're your best friend, the next day they're your mortal enemy. You know, it, it's so interesting when you look at samurai culture, because I know that um, when you look at all the different warrior co cultures, you know, that people talk about throughout the ages, you, you look at the Spartans, and you look at all, all these different warrior cultures. What we point to is we go, you know, wow, knighthood, you know, like we look at knights and, and we look at the whole chivalry, the idea of chivalry and, and everything like that. You know, I, I suppose when you're looking at the samurai culture, they actually followed a pretty strict lifestyle. And uh, it's a very unique warrior culture when, you know, and, and of course, you're going to fill me in on more of this. But mm. I've always been fascinated with samurai culture because everyone associates the samurai with their sword fighting capabilities. And uh, obviously, their artistic acumen, like they, they were all very good with art, and music and things like that. And, and, and had sort of an artistic side, a creative side. It's like they, they really... You know, they really wanted that development to be full fledged, like strong heart, mind, body, soul, everything to make the best warrior possible. But a lot of people don't associate the samurai with with gunfighting. But no. what, but they obviously used a heck of a lot of guns. <laughs> they did. So swords, so, as you mentioned at the start of that. Yeah. One sign of the samurai, like a mark of rank, was the fact they carried daisho or two swords, a big sword, a katana, which is the samurai sword, and a shorter version of that, which is called a wakizashi, which is a, a shorter sword, which, which looks similar. And by carrying those two swords, it really marked them out as a, as a samurai. Uh, you know, 
even before the arrival of guns on the battlefield in Japan, a sword is it's a good weapon, but it doesn't have as far reach as like a, a yari, which is a spear, or a bow, which is a projectile. So the sword was more of a, a backup weapon or something that would be carried by a cavalryman if they dropped their spear or th- their um, other other weapons. They weren't particularly useful on the battlefield. We've actually done research to find out the proportion of numbers of casualties caused on the battlefield. And I said it's less than 10% of casualties were caused by swords. M- majority of them are caused by um, arrows, projectiles, that sort of thing. So the sword was definitely a holdout weapon. So for the samurai, did, did they also have some form of uh, like servants, like a squire that would help them in battle with like, you know, obviously all that gear probably has to be hard to take on, yeah. you know, put on, take off. And, you know, did, did they have essentially like squires like knights did? Yeah, well, yeah, they had a, um, squires like knights. Um, it, there were, there were samurai and there were samurai. So you had samurai who weren't very wealthy. They had they had the privilege, they had the rank, and you know maybe they didn't have any kids or cousins. And it might have been the responsibility of one of their tenants to help them uh, in battle because they were they were also landlords. But typically, you'd find that um, the children or well the, the male children or the um, cousins of a samurai would act as the squires to give them a taste of battle and to get them used to that uh, martial um, skills that they're expected to learn as part of their station in society. So we're really talking about the warring states era. So this is before the, the 1600s, um, because of, of course after that, after the 1600s, there weren't so many battles to fight, although the samurai culture still existed. But if they were going to battle to put down a rebellion, or oh, is in the 1600s, yeah. Putting on the armor is is quite tough, and it's a shame. I'm, I'm using my desktop for this um, in, uh, this um, this chat because just over in the corner here, I've got my own set of armor, which will give you a, a decent idea about how many separate components there are, and it, why it takes about twenty minutes to put on an hour if you're trying to do it by yourself. Wow! So, in terms of the time frame, how early did the samurai start using guns? Well. The accepted date for the samurai using guns is 1543. So there's a small island, which I'm going to next week, actually, in the very south of Japan called Tanagashima. And, and a lot of people apply the name Tanagashima to guns. They, they say that's a Tanagashima gun. Well, yeah, you, you can say that. That's a bit like saying Kleenex instead of tissue or Evian instead of water. It's, you know, it's, it's a gun. People get it. The, the normal way to say it is Hinawaju or Tepo, which means metal gun or matchlock. That's the we don't normally hear Tanagashima outside of Japan, but but we know what it means. So they, oh, yeah. continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So these these Tanagashima arrived in 1543. Now guns did exist before that. Just a simple tube, and you put a match onto it yourself, and it ignites. You know things that came from China and Mongolia. Um, not particularly accurate. Probably lost a few fingers when people didn't use them properly. But in 1543, these guns with an external firing mechanism arrived, and that changed um, everything. It wasn't that the guns arrived. It was more that the important thing was the ability to recreate these guns arrived. Well, you know, and it seems like the really early black powder firearms were really nothing more than just a board or a stick with a tube attached to it, really crude. You couldn't really aim them. They yeah. probably had vicious recoil. And then also, you know, the powder probably wasn't as good as, as powder formulas improved to actually get some repeatable ballistics. They probably didn't understand bullet weights. So, of course, like they were just shoving whatever they could get down the barrel. Yeah. So there probably yeah, wasn't any consistency. Rocks. Yeah. So yeah. I guess a good question would be that at the arsenal there, at the castle, what's the oldest functional uh, gun you have there? The oldest functional gun we have is not from the Warring States era, the functional. We, the one we've got is, and in fact, it's my gun and it's back here, was made around the um, American and British uh, conflict. Um, what do you call it? 1776, independence, War of Independence. When you throw that, you shouldn't have thrown that tea away. It was real nice stuff, but you did. Anyway, this was made around the same era. And this is the important part. This, that is just a tube, yeah? Tubes can be made. Smoothbore? That's just a metal tube on a wooden stock. This mechanism is what changed warfare. And the ability to recreate it and have an external firing mechanism so that you can actually fire the gun two-handed more accurately. Wow. 
now I noticed on these uh, on these particular, I guess we'll just we'll just say for better lack lack of term for me, we'll just say these muskets, right? These matchlocks. I noticed that they don't really have stocks. Like they've just no. kind of like a pistol grip on the back. So what's yeah. the sort of tactical purpose? Is that, is that because of the armor that they were wearing to keep it short? Well, the vast majority of gunners, actually, they didn't really have armor because a lot of the gunners, uh, probably about 90% of the gunners were actually guided or militiamen. And they were just given what they were given. They would look, be lucky to have a helmet. They'd say, here's a gun, here's some ammunition. Teach you how to use it and go, go and shoot. Um, these guns are actually based on a Portuguese um, import from 1543, when that ship arrived in 1543, the the adventurers on board, these Portuguese um, sailors, had come basically from the Portuguese colony in India. They come underneath India around. There was a big storm, so they thought, well, we can't sail through this. Let's take shelter. Whilst they are on Tanagashima Island, they thought, let's get some fresh meat. Started shooting some waterfowl. The samurai on the island heard thunder and saw birds dropping out of the sky and thought, what is this? <laughs> They said, What's the, what are these? And they said, well, these are guns. And they bought them at well above market value. The, the lord of the island, whose name was Tanagashima Tokitaka, he said to his swordsmith, you're not a swordsmith anymore, you're a gunsmith now, make these. And because he made these, he, he did what he was told. He said, make, he didn't say make them and make them better, he said, make these. So he copied the design, and that's how it inherited these short um, guts on the, on the weapons. Wow, so it seems that those guns made quite the impression and it's interesting because when you look at the different mechanisms, I noticed that that mechanism actually has like a sear, you know, yeah. like an actual trigger. I know some of them used a serpentine that was nothing more than just a metal rod, a continuous metal rod that would provide a pivoting action that would hold the burning match cord. Yeah. Uh, but that actually has like a sear. You can set it and it's like a trigger, you know. And that, and that is what we would call a Tanagashima match lock one one that the sear which, which just moves just to pivot just pivots the device inside these ones here this is made it's a hino zutsu this is made in the hino region of japan and this actually does have a trigger so there's, there's a spring mechanism in here a coiled a coiled spring which um when you pull the trigger it activates the um the hibasami which is the firing arm here all right so we mentioned that this particular version is the one that you guys actually take out and drill with, you shoot with, you get in your in your armor and you you know do your drilling and everything. Um, you had mentioned that's the oldest functional gun. Yeah. What are some of the guns at the at the arsenal that are let's just say maybe they're not working but they're still really cool talking. Like what what's what's something in the castle that you wish worked that yeah. isn't running right now? The one that we wish worked is we've got a, a a Dutch artillery cannon that was bought from the Dutch and put onto a onto a um, ship. Um, for a samurai ship. Of course, you can't get further away from the water than Matsumoto. We are right in the middle of Japan, but we do have that. That's what I wish we could use. But as interesting pieces, we've got some pre-1543, just tubular firearms like we talked about. We've got some rocket launchers, called, they're called Bohir, and they fire phosphorus rockets as well. And that's basically just a large pot and you put a firework into it. But we also have some pre-1600 um, guns, but they're in such a delicate condition that even um, looking after them, it's a matter of putting on the 100% cotton gloves and, and carefully inspecting them to see if any maintenance needs, if no maintenance needs to be taken out, it's just keep them in a climate controlled um, armory and, and check them again in six months. Yeah. I would imagine that after that much time, that wood has to be awfully delicate and pretty dried yeah. out and, you know, you got to keep it from getting, you know, any bugs or moisture. I mean, I can only imagine that the storage conditions have to be impeccable to take care of all of that antique weaponry. I got a question about the rockets. So yeah. were the rockets more of a kind of a shock and all just to kind of scare the enemy or did they have some actual, you know, weaponization? Like did they actually hurt people or were they more for yeah. like just intimidating people? Well, as you know, we, we both fought in, um, in Iraq, right? Indirect fire. You don't like it initially. You get used to it eventually. So there is that shock and awe sort of aspect to it. But the important thing to remember with Japan is that during the warring states era, not many structures were built of stone because there's earthquakes. If you build something out of stone, it's going to fall over within a year or so because it should be shaken down. That means castles, fortifications, watchtowers, they're all built of wood. Now, these Bokia rockets were covered in phosphorus, and the idea was to try and hit a structure to try and set it on fire. Oh, wow. Well, that, that had to be terrifying to see, you know, flaming rockets flying through the air and things like that. I mean... 
it just goes to show how far warfare has progressed and, and how, you know, we always find a better way. And, you know, until we have a better way, we work with what we have. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned these fortifications like the castle and different buildings and structures that soldiers would take up residence in or defend structures, right? I've seen a lot of these. Um, in fact, I almost purchased one some years back, uh, like what they called a tower rifle, like some absurdly large black powder rifle with a big bore on it, you know, like usually a 75 yeah. caliber or larger. Um, there was There was one... It might have even been a Portuguese gun, or if I'm not mistaken, it, it was some sort of breech-loading Whitworth rifled tower gun that shot yeah. some absurdly big pill, like larger than my thumb, you know, really big projectile. Mm. But I would imagine that for these types of, you know, black powder firearms that the, that the castle has there in Japan, some of them are the large, what you know, tower, mm. like rampart guns. Yeah. You, so you have That's some the- rampart guns? Yeah, they were called Zamazutsu. So Zam- Zamazutsu is the name of the gun. And they were too crude because Japanese people, even by standards in those days, while well, Western people were shorter, Japanese people were shorter still. And so the gun was about 1.5 meters long, which made it a good, you know, 30 centimeters taller than the gunner. So they were double crude. And they, like you said, they were generally um, quite a lot, had a more substantial caliber. And they also had a, a heavier um, barrel construction, so you could put a bigger charge in there. And the idea was for those guns to harass approaching enemy before the um, the main um, defensive positions could open fire. And they could shoot up to, up to about 200 meters, uh, maybe 80 meters before the wind started or atmospheric conditions started affecting the shot. But the, the powder charge in it was substantial enough to, to fire that bullet out for a good couple of hundred meters. So to clarify on this technology, we're talking matchlock, smoothbore. Uh, yes. Are we talking uh, just a round projectile, round ball? No, there was a lot of experiments done with, um, and this, this is part of our collection at Matsumoto Castle. So if anyone does come to visit Matsumoto Castle, then we're well, more than happy to show you anything. We've got bullets that are square, triangular. We've got bullets that attach to bullets with little chains in them. Um, those ones are actually designed. The guy who designed those, we don't know the person's name, but we, we know his notes and he had a, a bullet, which is probably about, I, I don't know, a 14 millimeter bullet, so 14 mil, with a small chain and another 14 millimeter bullet. And he thought, that's going to be good for taking out horses. We don't know if he tested it, but that was his idea, was to sit, try and make a bigger hole on the beasts of war as they were coming through. So the samurai back then, when they started getting into these guns, right, you've got yeah. this uh, the short little gun with, you know, no stock, really. You can hold it in nice and tight. So yep. part of the, the reason that stock is so short, is that so you can hold it in real close and keep everything compact? Or yep. is it kind of the armor? Or what's the reasoning behind having the little short, compact stock? On? Well, there, there were two compact types of gun. There was the, the Tanzutsu, which is basically a matchlock pistol. They tended to be more of a status piece or anecdotally they were used for dueling and they weren't really used at bat- in war they were kind of made after the country unified but there was a i would say carbine you would say carbine of um called a bajozutsu and the idea that didn't have a stock is because it was carried by a, a, a mounted samurai and so he needed essentially a pistol grip so his left hand could hold the reins of the horse and his right hands could hold the um the, the gun without it being obstructed in his wrist so he could move it around as he needed Okay, so now are we talking, I've noticed on a lot of the videos on your Twitter page with uh, showing some of this volley fire and everything. So was that yeah. still the generally accepted tactic back then was for the samurai to get on a line and shoot a volley at the enemy? You know, that was pretty standard fare for most yeah. militaries of the world back then was volley fire. Yeah, there was there was two, two well, there was, there was more than two types of fire. But the big ones were Dairen and Shoren. Now, a Dairen is that big volley. The whole group fires now th- this group would be under the control of one samurai and then maybe two or three samurai um, under it so you can think about a tepal thai or a, um a, as a platoon and in that platoon you'd have maybe a, a one captain and then two lieutenants i'd say lieutenants and you know then some senior ashigaro militiamen sergeants equivalent people who could supervise so you may have 40 guns in total and that samurai captain would choose the target. He would say, this is your target, and that my order would get passed down by the other samurai in amongst it, and the, the NCOs, for want of a better word, and they, he would give them an order to fire, and he'd fire, wham, in one go. 
and that would be a big wall of lead coming and anything in the way of that wall of lead, gone. That would be a dynamic volley. A sodium volley is bang, 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 creates that rapid fire effect. And the whole point of that was to actually try and, um, it was less accurate because there was less lead going. You'd have to pick your own target yourself and try and hit it. But it was very disturbing to walk into this constant shooting, this non-stop sound of, of fire. And as you're walking, this person's falling down, that person's falling down, the person behind you's bought it. And so there was that kind of fire as well. There was also other types such as rotating fire or firing by groups in threes or, or tens, what have you. It really depended what the commander wanted. We always, when we think of that, at least me, for instance, I always think of the movie Zulu. I mean, that's a perfect yeah. example, a classic, right? Yeah. You know, first rank fire, first rank kneel, second rank move forward. And you're, you've got this constant state of reloading and firing to keep a constant wall of lead. So it would seem that that tactic would be quite useful. I mean, when you have a single uh, loaded, you know, weapon like that. So what kind of ranges are we talking that these things would be effective? Maybe 100 meters or... You'd be lucky to get a hundred meter. The, the infantry carried a gun called a Banzutsu. Now, all the guns are something Zutsu. Like I said, there was Tanzutsu, small one, and Bado Zutsu, which is carbine, Zama Zutsu, which was the, the tower gun. Uh, Banzutsu was the infantry's normal gun. Ban means number. So basically, the number was stenciled into the gun, and it came out of the armory and said, Here you go, this is your gun, give it back when you're finished. It's just like a, a normal armory. But they weren't very high quality. Sometimes they were called noodle guns because when they overheat, the, the barrel just droop, droop down. And so they throw that one away and get a new one. So they're almost disposable, really. But the metal was quite thin. They overheated quite quickly. And the, the more you shot it, the less effective it became. So whereas you might get a few shots at 80, 70 meters quite accurately, as the gun got hot and the metal got soft, you would become less and less effective. So these samurai uh, that are on these, you know, they're basically, they're controlling troops under them, essentially. So if, if yeah. we look at the samurai in this situation, it's almost like the NCOs or the captains, like they're more in a leadership role and they yeah. have people working under them. So let's say that, okay, these samurais are shooting guns, right? Okay, well, you know, this fire is already pretty close. So at what point do, do the samurai decide, well, we're going to, we're going to grab our swords and get the hack in here. I mean, did it get kind of bloody and close to the point where they're like, you know what, we're going to, you know, kind of the attached bayonets moment for them. What, yeah. what would that be? Would they, would they throw down the black flag and, and start drawing swords? It definitely happened. Yeah. So there was two things they could do. You, there were dedicated samurai zutsu units and they, they were just samurai gunners and they could fire really fast. I mean, whereas we, shoots an, an infantryman shoots about one shot every 30 seconds these samurai guns were well practiced and they could fire every 15 to 20 seconds and if you can imagine there was a group of um 10 of them that's that's quite a lot of rapid fire but once they got close they said drop the gun and we were talking about the squire before he'd see that his his uh, dad or his uncle had dropped the gun he'd go and collect that and then these guys are going with whatever other weapon they had available whether that be swords or more more than likely it's going to be a, a spear or something with a bit more reach on it so a lot of times these samurai the, their retainers essentially were family members clerks yeah. like people that worked in the family worked on the farm or whatever like literally there's like well we're going to war and that's our job now and then they would go to war well yeah you'd expect um the younger samurai the ones who maybe weren't quite mature enough or or, or large enough of body to, to do war, they were still expected to have a good knowledge of it. And where's the best knowledge is knowledge comes through experience. There's only so much you can get taught in the classroom because samurai were the only one who had the privilege of an education. There's only so much you can get through books and talking about it. it there was an element of trying to expose them. And I think it's important to recognize this is whilst Japan was fighting amongst itself. After Japan had unified, there was less of a need for this, um, this sort of um, action. You, you, it was more dedicated towards arts after that. But the art of war, as we're talking about now, was sort of uh, definitely a family business. Yeah. I want to bring up something I saw in one of your videos. And again, I keep going back to your Twitter page. Uh, guys, make sure you follow uh, Matt on Twitter, uh, Gun Samurai. I'll put the uh, link down below. And also make sure you follow their YouTube channel, obviously. I'm going to put all of his contact info down below in the description box. I had another another interesting little point. I wanted to see if if I made the connection on this or not. I yeah. noticed I was watching your reload drills, okay, and I noticed when they were reloading, uh, one of the samurai or soldiers, let's just say one of the gunners that was running the gun, 
I noticed it the old like kind of Napoleonic era little tap technique where like to tap the stock a little bit to settle the the charge and the ball. And that was yeah. a, that was a technique that Napoleon made popular with his troops. They would do the whole, you know, drop the powder, throw the ball in there and just give them, you know, the butt a little a little tap instead of running the whole rod down there. Kind of yeah. that little tap technique. So is that that looks like a technique that y'all seem to use. Yeah, that's it wasn't invented by Napoleon. There's a samurai technique. So, so yeah, Napoleon gun... learned it from y'all. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. samurai gunners, what you carry is, you, um, hang on, I've, got, I've got one over there. I'll show you. Them. It's a preloaded tube. So it's a bottle with the gunpowder, the ball, and the wadding in there. And you just pour it into the barrel and throw, the, throw that away. Now, if you're an Ashigaru or fighting as part of a, a larger unit, then hopefully there's going to be time for you to compress that and get a decent charge at the bottom of the gun and then fire. The samurai, who are firing a lot faster and at closer ranges, they just boop, boop, tap it in and then open up and ignite without doing the ramrod. Because, of course, taking out a ramrod, stuffing it down, then putting the ramrod back, well, that takes time. And as you know, battles have a rapidly collapsing time frame, don't they? So sometimes yeah. there's not time for that. And especially if cavalry is coming, you're not so concerned about whether the charge is completely pressed in effectively. It's still going to go bang and it's still going to throw some lead out. And that was the whole idea of that sort of uh, gunnery. I suppose their way of thinking was, well, we, it doesn't have to be like the perfect, perfect stuffed charge because it's so no. close that. Yeah, when know, they're 20 to 30 dead. meters away, makes no difference. And then trying to do that the entire time while tending a burning match cord, right? So we're yeah. talking uh, now the slow match that you use in your gunnery yeah. and at the castle. Is it very similar slow match to what was used at the time, like pretty much yeah. just uh, treated? <laughs> Pretty much a replica hemp rope with a potassium nitrate. So it burns at about 12 inches an hour, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I made some of my own match cord, and I think what I wound up doing was uh, taking black powder and just uh, melting it down like in hot water and adding like just a little bit of uh, tallow to that and then yeah. coating, the, coating the, the rope in that, the hemp rope in that, and it seemed to work fairly well. Yeah, we buy ours from a, from a supplier who manufactures the rope so I, I wouldn't know how to i know what it's made of but i wouldn't know how to do it myself i know there is a gunner um and he's a, a japanese um lad called shohei sano and he makes his own match course i've seen it seen a video of him doing it and he's soaking it in a bucket and i thought i ain't got time for that yeah so well you gotta you gotta yeah. trust the dedication though uh, you know i yeah. can only imagine so like in the early days when folks were running you know the serpentine match locks like they're real early type they yeah. had these uh, bottles they would wear on their on their person. Basically, I think they yeah. called the twelve apostles because they were literally twelve bottles yeah. of freaking powder. <laughs> so yeah. here you are tending this match cord the entire time, and you've got literal bombs hanging off your body. Were accidental discharges and accidents and things of that nature were they common on the battlefield? I I wouldn't know if they were common. I imagine they do happen because I've seen them happen when we do demonstrations as well. So if they happen when we're doing demonstrations in a in a controlled environment, and then the likelihood is when people are panicking and stressed out on the battlefield that there's going to be NDs or um, a, an unlucky shot where a, a bullet comes and hits someone on their on their powder. And we normally carry our powder in a, in a waste bag called a Doran, which you, you carry eight, nine, ten um, bottles in there, and then a, another tube of finer gunpowder which should be put onto the um, onto the firing mechanism here. So you can see that oh, that aperture there is where we'd apply the thinner gunpowder, and then this, this is essentially the safety catch. So the match should be in here. So if the match did go down by accident, that would hopefully protect, protect, prevent a, an ND. So we've got a safety catch on there, and then obviously you'd open it, and then that would touch the match to the um, to the uh, so gunpowder. So you've got your and main charge. You've got yeah. your main charge and the projectile, and then you've got a little bit of a fine, like, 4F pan powder for the... That's right. You can see there's a very, very small hole there which allows access into the into it so this really 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 fine powder is ground up and carried in another bottle and it's applied to the outside the external part of the gun and like i said this is this is the 1543 invention this is the guns existed in japan what happened was the ability to recreate this mechanism that was the important um important piece of technology can we take a look at some of your armor if you have it nearby i've got it nearby um, can you show it so how how light is that rifle? Is it, it seems like a pretty elegant little rifle. What would you say about five pounds, six pounds? Uh, I'm British. So I go kilograms. That one's about eight kilograms. 
Okay. This one is a little lighter. It's six kilograms. So it's a different one. Wow. So again, same firing mechanism, but made in a different part of Japan. And that's an important thing because, you know, in America, you've got Winchester or Remington or and such. Same thing in Japan. Guns were made in different areas. Different area means different metal making traditions, different kind of wood in the forests to make the gun stock. So there were variations around the um, guns. But anyway, armor, right. This, this might be tricky. It is here. Right. That is a set of armor. So it's made of various components. Boy. That's the main part. You've got these armored gauntlets, which um, cover the arm. So as you can see, it covers it, everything from the um, from the wrist all the way up to the for forearm and up to the, the bicep, the top of the arm. And that's followed by the cord plate, which is the shoulder armor. Wow. The shoulder. How heavy is that? About 20 kilograms. All in, and then you've got the um, the main plate, which is the door at the front, which is that. You can see the reflection, bro. I and have questions. The next, the crotch and the upper legs, and then there's so some what, leg what armor. Is it, made of? As well. it almost looks yeah. like an acrylic or something. What what what's it made of? Steel. It's made of steel, but it's it's painted with um in a traditional Japanese style to make it a. Uh, I've forgotten what that um, that art form's got. I'll probably remember it in a couple of minutes' time. But it's it's painted. It's not made of acrylic. It's, it's steel, but it's painted. It's can, to make it look um, more appealing. So the obvious question I'd have about the armor is: mm. this armor could stop these muzzle loader projectiles pretty easily, or were they really more for archery? Like we're concerned about arrows. A bullet is going through that, no problem. That's a bullet's going through like a knife goes through, but it's going straight through. But it would stop low velocity strikes. When I say low velocity, I mean arrows that have been fired from a, a, a considerable distance. It's not going to stop a close up arrow, of course, because there's going to be a lot of velocity in there still. Sword strikes are going to be uh, have good protection. Um, a lance or spear, if that's come from a person as opposed to with a horse behind it. It's going to offer some protection as opposed to complete protection. It doesn't make you invincible, but it's certainly going to add. It's certainly better than nothing. It's certainly better than what the Ashigaru the militia had. But it was. Yeah. Um, there were types of armor that were supposed to be bulletproof based on the sort of like European, um, a lot thicker, a lot heavier. But this armor was designed for mobility to be able to fight with different styles to be able to ride a horse at the same time. You know, horses, and I, I like riding horses myself. They get upset when you when you put on weight, let alone when you put on armor. So you need <laughs> too much on the horse makes it less maneuverable. So there's the balance to be struck, like in modern warfare, like with a tank, you've got to balance firepower maneuverability, haven't you? So, and protection. Same it's with the so armor. It's so crazy to see how, you know, armor has progressed over the years and that soldiers have always needed protection. It, it seems that that armor fills a similar role as like the flak vest in the Vietnam War for us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where, I mean, it ain't going to stop an AK round. It ain't going to hardly stop buckshot from a shotgun. It may not even stop pistol round. It might stop a piece of shrapnel, maybe, yeah. if you're lucky, right? Like, it was just kind of almost like a cope armor. Yeah. So in this in this crazy battlefield, there's smoke and chaos and people yelling and screaming and people giving orders and, you know, no telling what. Swords, lances, different weapons, spears, guns, everything going off, just complete chaos. Uh, that had to have been a frightening prospect to deal with. And under the context of we're talking, this is almost more of an internal conflict. Like these were feuds that were happening between rival families and dynasties, or if you will. So hmm. pretty interesting. Well, there was the Mongol invasion. This is before the uh, the um, firearms really became a big thing. So there was, there was example of you know, international conflict. And then there was the Korean invasion, uh, the Japanese invasion of Korea after the, the country unified. So there was a little bit of international conflict. But you're right; the mass, the vast majority of samurai battles happened between samurai clans and samurai clans, or rebelling um, clans, or religious rebels, or um, daimyo who had stepped out of line and had created some sort of insurrection. Even farmers who had banded together and created some sort of union, you know, they they would be the 
main uh, antagonists against the uh, the samurai o- overlords or landlords or whatever you want to call them. Wow, that's so crazy. So you guys are out here drilling all the time, and I'm assuming that people can visit the castle and take tours and things like it's. Y'all are sort of curating a museum, if you will, because you have yeah. all the castle's inventory. You guys are responsible for cataloging this stuff, keeping it clean, keeping it serviceable. And obviously you're probably undergoing some current restorations, trying to get some of the other guns, you know, working or, you know, something like that. Are there any cool restorations you're working on you want to tell us about, like that you're trying to get going in terms of we've got no, the castle? We've got no significant additions to the um, arsenal. But we've got one... Um, also, like a, a man, a man portable cannon, and I uploaded that video like three or four days ago, and it's, it's a massive cannon just going off in that one shot with a fifty gram charge inside it. So that's that's the latest addition, and that was a test firing. And like, yeah, that that thing works nicely. And we're going to be firing that at a show at the castle on the fifteenth of October this year. So I know it's hard for people to get out to Japan, but if it's on the fifteenth of October, you can bet that on the sixteenth or seventeenth of October on my channel, it'll be there for people to see so that gunner he's a specializes yasuda san his name is yasuda he specializes in operating the heavier guns and he wears the same armor as as, as we do with the with the black equipment on and so he's going to fire that gun for the first time in well the, the, essentially that was the first time that gun's been fired in about 200 years but it's going to be fired at the castle for the first time in many many generations yeah on the wow. 15th of october isn't that cool to, to be, you know, the you know to deal with the custodianship of that history? Like you're trusted to, you know, keep this weaponry running and to preserve the history and to, you know, really show all the the upcoming generations, you know, the, the history behind everything, military history. It's just it's such a fascinating endeavor, and it takes a lot of discipline to learn all the proper form and techniques and drill movements. Yeah. I would imagine there's many drill movements you have to learn just like any other soldier would have to learn yeah. in order to love these is, things. Hmm. It's, it's Japan. All right? So we've got martial arts and the martial arts is called hojutsu. So in America, I guess the, the more popular martial arts, maybe like karate or judo, or, and sometimes you'll see people doing the space on their own. They're, they're showing off their form, their, their discipline, their um, ability to do what's called a kata. Well, the same thing applies to this martial art, which is hojutsu. And the way you hold the gun, the way you move with the gun, it's a martial art itself. And there certainly is an art part to it. It's supposed to look good because once the country had unified, what we had was a, a, a core of elite soldiers, the samurai, and they're actually gathered retainers, those who were still expected to take part in military um, duties. Well, they would do skill at arms demonstrations. And the skill at arms demonstration, it looks a lot better if you do it properly. And then, not only does it look better if you do it properly, it looks better if you do it artistically as well. And because the country was generally at peace for the 300 years, the martial art of Hojutsu evolved from something which was just the application of warfare on the battlefield, shoot quickly, shoot accurately, and let's win, into something which is a, a lot more appealing to look at. It's almost uh, like in America we have you know exhibition shooting, where essentially it's like, you show off your skill by doing kind of crazy trick shots and things. Yeah. So maybe not exactly on that uh, end of things, but more about it needs to look right. It needs to look practiced. Like it, it has to, it has to be a movement that someone can look at and be like, wow, these people know what they're doing versus, yeah. you know, you don't want to go out there and, and look all ate up and, and not look right doing it. Like, especially yeah. in peacetime, you're talking 300 years of peace. It's easy for those drill movements to go by the wayside and for people to get kind of sloppy so that training was probably even more important in peacetime for them to stay, to keep those skills sharp and to be able to, to you know, do exhibitions and, and show people how, how good their skills are home. That's right. It was good for the exhibitions. And there's also a contingency. You can imagine that if something did happen, if there was a rebellion, you would have a corps of men ready to shoot, who knew how to shoot. You wouldn't need to teach them and say, right, lads, we're going to war, get your equipment, let's go. There's no time for training. And that did happen occasionally, in particular, the, the Mito Rebellion, which, which this uh, clan, the Matsumoto clan, where I live, they were involved um, with. They had to, they intercepted some Mito rebels who came from the northern part of Japan, and they were trying to march on Kyoto, which is the which was the seat of power for the shogun. And they got intercepted near to where I live by a, a joint um, an alliance, and the, they knew they were coming. They didn't have time to sort of like, okay, let's train up an army for a few months and teach the soldier what a soldier's job is. 
he's got to be able to do this, 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 this. No, they said, get the guns, let's go. Well, not just the guns, but all the equipment. They said, get it, let's go. And they intercepted them at a place um, near to here called the uh, Wada Valley. And there was um, actually a, a, an old battle site with the graves of the samurai who, who fell on that battle. And it was a big, it was a big gun battle, essentially. But no training, it was just a, a spontaneous deployment of the Matsumoto clan. So almost like the uh, Samurai Minutemen, you know, be ready to go. Oh, Grab yeah, a gun and let, let's go head this off. Yeah, that's right. That's what happens. Yeah, the Battle of the Wada Valley. It's interesting because the Battle of the Wada Valley, it's in a, in a book called Before the Dawn, which is in Japanese. So I, I can't translate it because someone's got the copyright for it. But I might make a video or a Wikipedia page about it because it's one of the lesser known battles. But it's actually a really interesting one. It's not just a big battle. It's like like you said, I could compare it to the to the Minutemen or the... Um, or the militias of the uh, of the American um, era, or, or possibly the militias of the European era as well. It was kind of like, let's go, like, get your stuff, we're going. And it was an interception. They'd head them off because they knew they were coming. They didn't have time for, right, say goodbye to the kids, oh, and don't you have a meal and go, let's go and pray. So we're going now. And so it's a really interesting battle. All right, so another question, and I suppose I'm, I'm not going to hold you this one uh, to hold you to this one too much because I know we didn't exactly discuss this before, but in Japan, in Japan, after, you know, what I always view as sort of the transitional period uh, between black powder to smokeless powder, where you have these kind of odd, um, let's say, repeating black powder rifles that, you know, like the, the Dutch Beaumont, you had like the, the yeah. Springfield trap door and you had, um, you know, things like the Vetterly. It was all these kind of weird, quirky, you know, magazine fed repeater cartridge contained black powder rifles and things like that. I suppose a question I would have for you is, would be after the era of match locks and things like that, what, what was the next phase that a lot of these, uh, what, what was the, what were the next weapons that they, that they developed or, you know, adopted after the match locks? Okay. So the, the match lock really was a, the primary weapon of the um, formed Japanese military of the samurai era. So the infantry would have sword spears. You'd have a core of um, samurai who would also be equipped with bows and um, riding horses. And uh, there'd be a lot of guns. Everyone would know how to use it. And even during the rebellions and towards the end of the feudal era, matchlocks were still being used. It was an American, and he's probably quite, quite a famous guy. Matthew Perry was his name. He was an American Commodore, not not the guy from Friends, but the, the, the sailor. He came in and opened up trade. So whereas there was a little bit of flintlock, there was a little bit of percussion cap and um, imports from Europe for always those sorts of things, they were few and far between. After Matthew Perry came, and they, they realized, well, our army, we thought they were the best, and we thought they were outstanding, and you know, they trained their whole lives a bunch of you know drunk sailors who are feeling rather poorly because they've traveled all the way from the pacific all, all the way to japan and then you know these guys are better equipped and more than likely going to be able to defeat the samurai it all came down to equipment so it literally went from black powder as the main weapon to cartridges as the main weapon isn't that crazy how just one event in history can just change your entire outlook on tactics because it's one thing for the samurai to go duking it out with each other with the same yeah. exact weaponry. But when, you know, it's a peer to peer conflict and you've got, you know, some major power versus who you, who yourself you view as a major power, at least in your, in the own world you live in, that had to have been a scary moment for them to kind of wake up and be like, Oh crap. Like the modern world yeah. is here and we have to contend with it. It really was the catalyst for the end of the samurai era. You, you had two camps. You had those who wanted to modernize, and you had those who wanted to honor the old ways. And they even had a a, a, a phrase: that "Expel the barbarian, revere the emperor." Was you know they really they really wanted to say, "Well, let's close the country. I don't have anything to do with these um, people." And on, on the other side of the camp, they said, "Well, wh why don't we become as powerful as this this nation? Look at them. They they turned up in a metal ship. It, it don't need sails. It propels itself. You know he's." These cannon are huge. I mean, one shot can destroy a, a, any of our fortifications. And so there was those who are saying, well, let's just do what we've always done and they pretend this never happened. Well, not pretend it never happened, but go back to the old ways. And the others who realized, well, we thought we were powerful. Let's make ourselves actually powerful. It's just so fascinating when you look at Japanese culture and how they have always honored tradition. 
It's always been about conserving tradition and conserving the old ways and conserving their heritage, which that I appreciate very much about Japanese culture. And it's, it's so fascinating that even in the face of absolute death, even in the face of a modern army showing up with this crazy ship that doesn't require wind, it's like, what in the heck is happening here? They, they probably didn't know what to think because if what you've been using for centuries works, right? And that's what you're yeah. used to, and, and it's been effective for you, then then why change? I can sort of understand that. But I would imagine that in Japan, there was a lot of pushback from both sides of the aisle where, you know, one, one wanted to embrace tradition, you know, go back, you know, maintain the old ways. And then another group is like, no, nah, we want to we want to be like these guys that just stepped off this metal ship here. But, well, that's right. And that's basically the, the catalyst for change. And it did go towards the um, end of we are going to be like the guys off the metal ship. Trade opened up. Samurai were soldiers. They they were above sort of like handling money and, and trading. So what you had was the traders, the, the people who arranged the contracts or did arrange the imports and exports of Japanese goods and American goods coming in or European goods. They became more wealthy than the samurai, right? So the samurai who, who were supposed to be at the top of the society were still at the top of society, but they had less money and less influence. I mean, of course, money can buy you weapons. It can buy you political influence. It can, you know, it puts you in a better position than the samurai. So by allowing in this new trade, it wasn't just the arrival of guns, it was the arrival of medicine, it was the arrival of a technology that hadn't existed in Japan before. And the traders, the, the merchants who got involved with that, it became more important than the samurai. I mean, because you can imagine, for example, in your local neighborhood and anywhere, the, the most important people are people like doctors, lawyers, these sorts of people, right? In the feudal era, the samurai were above them, but once this modern equipment arrived, modern medicine arrived, modern ideas arrived, modern engineering arrived, it was the engineers, the doctors, and the policy makers, the diplomats who sort of became more important in the, the elite military. It's almost like, you know, maybe the, the samurai, you know, kind of viewed it from the perspective of it was almost like their way of life, like lacked honor moving forward. Like they didn't see the honor in that. They didn't see the honor in someone being able to just buy, you know, a keg of powder and, and a bunch of modern guns and, and someone with essentially no skill could have maybe just a little bit of uh, basic training. And now you've got a guy that, you know, maybe a, a, even an unskilled person can get a, a lucky. Right. And maybe they viewed it as, I mean, Hey, that's, that's my job. My, it's my job to, to do war. It's my job to protect the emperor or whatever. And may, maybe they just saw it as a, as it lacking honor compared to their profession. Like, you know, a merchant buying a bunch of guns and handing them out to some mercenaries doesn't quite have the the honor of Bushido, you know. Maybe no, they just viewed it as, "Hey, you're 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 not a warrior. You're you're just a sellsword," you know. Yeah, well, there, there, there certainly was an, an element of that to it. This is why they had this expel the barbarian, revere the emperor um, thing. They wanted to come back to that Confucius style of um, hierarchy of uh, of society, where the samurai at the top and then. You had the various other people underneath, and merchants were merchants were always at the bottom of society because they didn't make anything, right? So they weren't craftsmen; they didn't produce anything for people to survive, such as medicine, foods, and, and, and water. They were the bot. They sold other people's stuff. So all of a sudden, the people who are always at the bottom of society were right at the top, and so there was going to be naturally a lot of pushback because the guy you used to buy your booze from is now a, you know, considerably wealthier and um, more influential than you you are because he can do deals with the in, people who are importing uh, new technology into the country wow man that is so fascinating i mean like what you do your job is so fascinating that's so cool that you get to curate this arsenal and and to demonstrate all of this heritage to people that are visiting the castle i know i might have asked you this perhaps when the camera wasn't rolling but i do want to clarify so you've got your castle, you know, where, yeah. where you're at, where you're stationed, if you will. And you've got your group of people does all their historical reenactment and things. So I'm assuming there's multiple castles all around Japan that yes. do the same thing. Am I right? Yeah. There are other Tepotai, so it's called a Tepotai or a gun team. Um, and we're all going for a big meeting on Tanagashima Island next week. Um, so there's going to be, what, I don't know, 15 teams. There's, there's more than 15 teams but there's going to be about 15 teams go down so we're going to meet up and have a big um well i guess you, you call it a cookout in america or something like that so we're going to bring the guns and eat and drink and it's going to be great fun um, yeah, have yeah, a range day. yeah yeah range day and some demonstrations and show off to each other so look how good our team is compared to yours so yeah 
there are other um, shooting teams in in Japan, and even within this prefecture or within this state, which is Nagano, there, there's two. There's um, ours, which is Matsumoto Castle, Temple Town, and there's um, Ueda Castle, which is nearby. But they've only got six or seven um, people, and they only perform once a year. But yeah, lots of other not, teams. They're not near as good as you guys are. Okay. They're not near as good. We're, we're the only one who can, someone who can speak both languages, so Japanese and English. So we're the ones who can get the message out to the to the rest of the world. As you, in Japan, like I said um, before, the cameras running. If you said Japan to someone in Japan, or the samurai use guns, they're like, yeah, we know. Yes, and we get taught this in history. T- communicating that message outside of um, Japan is, 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 I get a lot, even now I get pushed back, I get trolled on Twitter and in, in, in YouTube and they say, oh, some I didn't use guns, they, they, they thought there was something about I say, well, okay, where's it, which, which samurai said that? And okay, there were a few samurai who did think it was dishonorable, but like, when you were in the army and I was in the army, and you better kit turned up, you're like, nah, I'm going to use that, you know, keep that away. It was more like that sort of thing. But you have to bear in mind that the samurai Tanegashima Tokitaka in particular, and Oda Nobunaga and his other generals, they brought in the guns, they trained people how to use the guns, it was the samurai who led them into battle, the samurai who were expected to use their greater courage and skill to show the militia how to do it properly. Okay, so the samurai were using guns since 1543, and the first battles were really like 1548 in Wadehara near here, there was a few other skirmishes beforehand. Yeah, the samurai didn't think they were dishonorable, the samurai were like, well, why are we bringing swords to gunfights? I can take this guy out from here, and there's a lot more honor in winning than there is, you know, in in fighting a, a sword battle one on one. I mean, the battle evolved from one on one to formation battles. Right? Don't bring a sword to formation. That idea does get discounted quite often, where people yeah. tend to tend to forget. I mean, yeah. I mean, look, knights had, you know, codes of chivalry and and whatever codes of conduct. I mean, hey, the Spartans had a code. Right. You know, the, the, the samurai had a code. But at the end of the day, you're fighting to win. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you can be as honorable as you like when you're dead. I mean, what difference does that make? I mean, you've, you've got you've got to win and you've got to win for the glory of your your daimyo because your samurai samurai essentially meaning to serve. But what use are you to the people you're supposed to protect if you're losing? So there's, there's no honor in that. I and mean, people aren't they're going to quickly grow tired and say, well, why do you got samurai? Why don't we just employ a Minutemen. We'll, we'll create our own Minutemen. It's a bunch of farmers with guns and we'll just blow a whistle whenever we need them and they'll turn up, drop the pitchforks and come with the guns. It, so they, they did understand that and and as such, guns weren't viewed as dishonorable. It, the reason I think some people think it was dishonorable is because of the Hollywood effect. And there was a book also written, I'm not going to say the name of the book or the author, but he also talked about all guns were dishonorable. Said, oh, well, were they? Well, the, there's a strong argument to suggest that that's incorrect. And the, the argument to suggest it's incorrect is probably stronger than the argument he put in the book. You know, like, like I said, Samurai brought the guns in. They ordered them into production. They led them into battle. They trained people how to use them. They stockpiled them. They deployed them. They managed the deployment. They selected the targets. Uh, yeah. Every, uh, every soldier wants to win. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. You know, I, I know this conversation could go on forever and everything. We, we've been talking about some awesome stuff. I know we talked a little bit about some of the techniques, different weaponry, armor, you know, a bit of the history. And so some of my viewers here, obviously, if they want to follow you, uh, where can they find you on Twitter? Well, Twitter is Gun Samurai, so two words, Gun Samurai. And that's basically the, the, the handle we've got on all of our social media. So, uh Instagram, Gun Samurai, Facebook, Matsumoto Castle Gun Corps, because that's more of a formal, uh, says we're actually attached to the castle. And on YouTube, that's Gun Samurai. And if people are interested in TikTok, I've just been released from TikTok prison because they didn't like me posting pictures of guns. I'm out now. That's Gun Samurai as well. So Awesome. Good deal. Matt, I really appreciate you taking the time because I know it's a crazy time difference. Uh, you're actually in the future right now. Yeah, right? I'm in the future. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> I'm talking to somebody in the future. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me here and, uh, and come on the channel. And guys, make sure y'all are supporting Matt and his efforts because he's doing such great work, you know, sharing all of this history and this heritage of, of Japanese culture, and uh, which I, I'm not going to lie, is downright fascinating. And Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me here today. And uh, I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. And we hope to have you on the channel again any anytime you'd like to be here. Oh, my pleasure. I really enjoyed it.
Outstanding. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's video. We have a lot more special guests on the way. I hope you enjoy this format. Um, check them out, The Gun Samurai, Large and In Charge. Really cool stuff. And when he drops that video of them shooting that uh, the big boy there, I'm going to share that on my post feed there uh, here on YouTube. So uh, be on the lookout for that video. I will share it once Matt drops it. Uh, thank you all very much. Many more videos on the way. We'll see you soon.